On January 9, 1493, while sailing near the Dominican Republic, Christopher Columbus observed something he said he had seen once before near the coast of Africa. His journal entry on that January day detailed the sighting of three mermaids that swam and frolicked in the waves around his ship. Frolicking mermaids. I'm your host, Leah. And I'm Steve. Today's Remnant Stew is all about the lore and legends surrounding mermaids. If you have an appetite for the strange and bizarre, then pull up a chair and grab a spoon for another intriguing serving of Remnant Stew. Remnant Stew is gluten-free, organic, made from all natural free-range ingredients and guaranteed to provide the recommended daily serving of curiosity. Okay, Steve, so it's February. What are we celebrating? I love February. That's a great month. Well, of course, February 14th, little advanced warning, is Valentine's Day. That's that, a Sunday. That's right. This is your warning. Go out and get something. All you right. don't have don't, an excuse. Don't be caught off guard. Uh, but most, <laughs> and Phil's over here sighing. What? He's going, what? Uh, now, most of you know that February 2nd is Groundhog Day. But you might not have known that February 2nd also observes many other holidays as well. For example, you guys, did you know that February 2nd is Play Your Ukulele Day? Sweet. Yeah. Sweet, yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. And uh, So you music yeah. lovers, get out your, your four-stringed instruments and strum away. It's also a day to get people interested in the ukulele. Uh, U-K-U-L-E-L-E. You know, ukulele. There you go. Play Your Ukulele Day. Uh, oh, you know what? You could combine it with this one. Uh, February 2nd is also... National Tater Tot Day. <laughs> Sonic, <laughs> Sonic Tater Tots Sonic. are the best, aren't they? So you can play your ukulele and Str- you know that's well, a, and, or, yeah, I think and, after after the ma- session's over, we'll pull we'll stroll over to the Sonic and uh, play our ukulele and like, order some tater tots. Yeah, like while you're ordering, do, do it in song right? while you're playing. Song. That's yeah. right. That's, that sounds like a great February idea. February second. Yeah, for sure. Um, It's also African-American Coaches Day, and I I think that's so important because uh, I know in the African-American community, uh, coaches are such an an important role model for so many kids growing up. I've known some outstanding uh, African-American coaches uh, during my time as an educator, and so I really like that that day is especially set aside to honor African-American coaches. Now, internationally, you might not know, that February the 2nd is also the Day of the Crepe. Oh, I love crepes. Yeah, I do too. Called Jour de Crepe, the holiday is associated with the Catholic feast of Candlemas. And I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb and say it's a French, well, I'm <laughs> a guessing French so, holiday. Right. <laughs> on this day, households all over France make crepes. This is because it's believed that crepes symbolize prosperity. Of course they in do. In fact, in many French households, it's customary to make crepes while holding a coin in your hand. The belief is that if you flip the crepe in the air and catch it in the pan without dropping the coin, the upcoming year will be a prosperous year for you. Okay, who in France dropped the coin in 2020? That's what we need to know. Uh, that's what, yeah, that's what's wrong. There you go. Now, one more observance on uh, February 2nd. There's a lot crammed into February yeah, 2nd. Yeah, there are quite a few. In fact, we left a few off just so that we didn't just uh, fill you up too much with February the 2nd uh, trivia. But this one was notable. It is Sled Dog Day. In fact, on February the 2nd in 1925, mushers embarked on a journey to deliver medicine to Nome, Alaska, sparking the Iditarod race. And so that's where that race began, uh, February the 2nd, 1925. So there we go, everybody. Happy February 2nd. Happy Groundhog Day. Happy Crepe Day. Happy Tater Tot Day. And honor to all African-American coaches. Wow, so much. Th- Do you know that there is not a Mermaid Day? There's, you know, we there's should no, start a Mermaid we Day. We need to start a Mermaid Day. I think day. we should start a Mermaid Day. So talking about Christopher Columbus, you know, he didn't describe the mermaids he saw as being the beautiful creatures of fairy tales. He said he quite distinctly saw, and and I'm quoting from his his journal entry, three mermaids which rose well out of the sea, but they were not so beautiful as they're said to be, for their faces had some masculine traits. Oh, that's kind of disappointing, I would think. So it's suspected (laughs) that he was actually seeing manatees. In fact, mermaid legends are thought to be sightings of manatees by sailors who quite often are drunk or had never seen manatees before. (laughs) From LiveScience.com, some researchers believe that sightings of human-sized ocean animals, such as manatees and dugongs, 
might have inspired merfolk legends. So uh, dugongs, what's a dugong? Well, they're cousins of the manatee and are similar in appearance. Whereas manatees swim in freshwater, the dugong is strictly a marine mammal. Uh, I see. The way they stay out in the ocean. They don't let so, them come close. So these animals have flat mermaid-like tail with two flippers that resemble stubby arms. And they don't exactly look like a typical mermaid or merman. But many sightings were from quite a distance away, right. being mostly submerged in water and waves. Only part of their bodies were visible. So identifying animals in water is inherently problematic. Sure. Um, and so so scientists think that that most mermaid sightings, and there are so many, they go back and they're, they're all across all cultures, right. uh, but they're probably mostly manatees. It's especially or difficult when you're a drunken sailor. So you know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, and, okay, so as an aside, here's a fun fact oh. about manatees. You ready? I'm ready. Lay it on me. So I got this from riotfest.org. If you've ever seen a manatee in person, you may have noticed that they're hilarious. And it didn't <laughs> specify why they thought it was hilarious, but, uh, but well, maybe we'll it tells... We'll take their word for it. Yeah. Maybe it tells good jokes. I don't know. So you may have noticed that they rise and sink in the water with almost no noticeable movement. Scientists have found that they, in fact, use their flatulence to swim. That's well, right. Okay. They use farts. Now I see the funny part. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess that's what makes them hilarious. So how are they able to do that? Well, manatees do not have <laughs> swim bladders to help regulate their buoyancy and stay horizontal in the water column like a lot of fish do. Right. So several things help, including the dense ribs located towards the front of the body and no hind limbs. Another me- method used with great results is actually flatulence. Sure. Manatees Jet re- propulsion, I suppose, right? <laughs> manatees release or store gases in their system. To drop or rise at will. So, yes, they use their farts to swim. <laughs> and a, an adult manatee will eat between 100 and 150 pounds of vegetation each day. Well, that would explain it. <laughs> which means a lot of gas builds up. And if they want to float to the top, they hold it in. If they want to sink, they let it rip. Uh-huh. And, and the article ends with, we don't suggest you try this method of swimming at home. Oh, but I think you could become bloated. I'm thinking, uh-huh. go ahead. If that's what you want to do, and let us know how that works. Yeah. We might even put you on the microphone and let you tell, us, tell us your experience in person. No, we won't. <laughs> you do that at your house. And maybe warn the people. In I the have pool. some grandsons, I think, that would love to try. <laughs> but, okay, so here's the deal. I wanted to know if dugongs do that. Like, it, right. all, it talked about manatees, but it didn't talk about dugongs. And so I Googled, do Dugongs. Dugongs. Do dugongs. Fa- and Google, like, let me down. Okay, oh, I've got on. some really strange Google search results. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So if there's any marine biologists out there, let us know. Yeah, I'd never even heard of a dugong before this minute. So, but d- so do, do dugongs, do dugongs use their farts to swim? Well, let us know. Now we know. Okay. <laughs> well, Moving you might along. <laughs> we have some interesting uh, myths, legends about mermaids you might be interested in. Um, they're depicted as both beautiful and kind, hideous and evil, or any combination thereof. Mermaids have often been mentioned in legends and folklore stories, each giving an individual twist to the identity, identity of the creatures. Mermaid stories are not restricted to one specific region of the world. Rather, they are told all across the globe, from Europe to Africa and Asia. Mermaids might be a variation of Greek mythology uh, creatures. The sirens, remember the sirens? In, I do. Uh, oh, the siren. I do. Oh, yeah, that's a great story. Sirens were dangerous but gorgeous creatures that lured sailors to their deaths with their beautiful singing. The modern notion of mermaids comprise mostly a, a sexy, beautiful, and captivating female half-human creature. In some traditions, they are kind creatures with powers. Mermaids are also often said to be able to fall in love with humans after which they set out to find a cure to get rid of their fish tail for legs. I think I remember seeing that movie, that uh, uh, Little Mermaid right. movie. Hans Christian Andersen-based uh, story, I believe. Uh, nice mermaids have inspired children's stories and other works of art like paintings and operas. In Copenhagen, Denmark, there's a nice a statue of the Little Mermaid from Hans Christian Andersen's stories. Well, and, the I d- and let me just stop you there and say that the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale is not as sweet and kind right. as, as the Disney as the version. Disney version. Yes. So, Mermaids are not always restricted to being nice, though. Rather, some stories describe them as being portents of bad luck. They are often associated with calamities like storms, shipwrecks, and drownings. Mermaids from Greek legends can even sink ships. 
being unkind to them might bring misfortune to the perpetrator. Yeah, you wouldn't would want to be unkind to a mermaid, I wouldn't think. Um, also, uh, we cannot forget the mer people of the Harry Potter world. J.K. Rowling gave a new twist to this type of creature in her Harry Potter series. They were depicted as ugly and aggressive. That's right. I remember that. Yeah. Some legends say that mermaids are soulless, yet others believe mermaids are immortal. There you go. There's facts. Absolutely. Or some Trivia. Some quick, quick trivia about, about mermaids. Now, we do find from Atlas Obscura that there's a most unusual artifact in the church in Zinar, England. This church consisting of a stone structure built between the 13th and 15th century. A tower and a small graveyard is dedicated <clears throat> to St. Sinara. The church is in the village of Zinar in Cornwall. Inside the church is the mermaid chair. The wooden seat dates back possibly to the 15th century. It's carved from oak, and it depicts a woman with long hair and a curvaceous figure. But in place of human legs, she has a scaly tail with fins. In her hands, the mermaid holds a comb and a mirror. There's a legend in the town that a beautiful and richly dressed woman attended church there. She was known for her lovely singing voice, but no one knew where she came from or where she stayed. They also noticed over the years that she never seemed to age. It was said that she fell in love with the church warden's son, Matthew Truella. One day, Matthew followed her home, and the two were never seen again. Except that the lady was seen once more. You see, sailors on board a ship that was anchored out at sea reported that a mermaid swam up, got their attention, and politely asked that they move their anchor as it was blocking her door, and she could not get to her husband and children. <laughs> <laughs> the sailors recognized the mermaid as being the woman, that had been a visitor to the church, because the sailors are always in church on Sunday, and he said oh, it makes right, perfectly right. good sense. The villagers then knew their, their mystery woman had then taken Matthew Truella to the sea. Some people say that the bench was carved to commemorate the legend, to warn other young men who may be tempted by mysterious women. Don't follow them yeah, home. Don't go, don't go home with them. Uh, others say that the mermaid chair was the very bench on which the mystery woman would sit as she sang in church. You can visit the church and see the mermaid chair for yourself. We also have a picture of it that we'll put on our webpage. And now for something completely off topic and off kilter. Brace yourself for the oddity du jour. Well, today for our oddity du jour, we are going north of the border to Canada to talk about a really interesting accidental discovery. You see, in 1989, this fellow named David Bailey... He was a researcher for the Canadian government in the field of clinical pharmacology. That's the study of how drugs affect humans. He accidentally stumbled onto a major discovery. Working in his lab in London, Ontario, Bailey was testing various medications in different circumstances to see how humans react to them. In 1989, he was working on a blood pressure drug called feld feldoprene, I believe, trying to figure out if alcohol affected response to the drug. The obvious way to test these, that sort of thing, of course, is to have a control group and an experimental group, one that takes the drug with the alcohol and one that takes it with water or, some, or, or with nothing at all. But, of course, scientific protocol calls for the study to be double-blind. You know about a double-blind study? That's right. That way neither group knows which one they're taking. That way they can't, uh, they can't uh, um you know, fudge skew on the it, results. Right, yeah. skew it. And then, so how right. would they know? I mean, they would know if they were drinking alcohol. Yeah, or, so that's the problem, water. though. How would you know if you're, you know, you, you know you're drinking alcohol unless you can find some way to mask it? And so that's what, uh, that was what David's challenge was. Well, one Saturday night, he and his wife, Barbara, began experimenting with different types of juice to see which one would mask the taste of the alcohol. And nothing was working until they tried grapefruit juice which did a remarkable job of hiding the alcohol's flavor. So Bailey gave his experimental volunteers a mixture of grapefruit juice and alcohol, while the subjects in the control group were served grapefruit juice only. The results were, let's just say, unexpected. While uh, there was a slight difference in blood pressure between the two groups, the surprising part was that the amount of the drug found in the bloodstream was four times higher than it should have been among members of both groups. Oh, wow. Both that... groups. So what was going on? 
Well, the discovery led Bailey's research into an entirely new direction. What was it about grapefruit juice that was radically, uh, so radically messed with the drug's interaction with humans? And here's what he found. You see that human stomachs possess a group of enzymes called cytochrome P450. That's, um, there'll be a test later, so make sure you make notes on that. <laughs> cytochrome P450, which breaks down food and other substances that are swallowed. Uh, pharmaceutical companies factor this into their dosage formulations as they try to determine what's called the bioavailability of a drug, or in other words, how much of a medicine actually gets to your bloodstream after running through your stomach, because your stomach actually breaks down large percentages of the drug before it gets to your bloodstream. That's right. We're getting really sciencey here. There you go. Um, well, with some drugs, only about 10% actually make the complete trip. Thus, 90% of the drug in the medicine that you take is really lost uh, to the stomach enzymes. I it gets know all that. dissolved. Right. I right. knew that. So to compensate for this, the manufacturers pack 10 times the amount of the drug into the medication that you take. Not always 10 times. It might be in like four times. If, if a fourth of the drug is getting through, then they'll pack four times as much in uh, just to, to, so to give you the right dosage. Um, grapefruit, though, has a high volume of a compound called Firm, no, go okay. ahead, pronounce that. <laughs> Furanocumarins. There you go. If you R A N O C O U M A R I N. And here's what these furanocumarins do. Oh, uh, you just that just rolled right off your tongue that well, time. <laughs> Say it once. I got it down. Um, they're designed to protect the 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 fruit, the grapefruit, uh, from fungal infections. However, when you ingest these uh, compounds. Well, here's what they do. They wipe out your entire P450 enzymes, and it takes about 12 hours for them to come back. That means that when you take a medicine after consuming a grapefruit or grapefruit juice, uh, your body will get zapped by the full measure of the medication, not just the low percentage that was calculated for you by the drug manufacturer. That's pretty interesting, huh? Yeah, yeah. Some common medications that can get screwed up by grapefruits include um, mm-hmm. ben, ben, <laughs> yeah, here we go. Benzodiazepines like Xanax, Clonopin, Valium, uh, amphetamines like Adderall and Ritalin, anti-anxiety ma- uh, medicines like Zoloft and Paxil, cholesterol-lowering statins like Lipitor and Crestor, uh, erectile dysfunction drugs like Cialis and Viagra, and various over-the-counter medications, even Tylenol, Allegra, and Prilosec. Um, and about 100 others it mentions as well. Um, this is why you will sometimes, and I've, I've seen this a time or two, you'll see a warning label on certain medications that tell you to avoid grapefruits when taking that medication. I, I've seen that too. I wondered about it. Yeah. That was very specific. With certain medications, the unintended overdose can be dangerous. And this is com- compounded by the fact that grapefruit is very popular among the elderly. Because the strong taste is, you know, as you grow older, you lose some of your ability to taste things. But grapefruit uh, seems to, 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 to uh, surpass that. According to the article, it is likely that people have died as a result of mixing medications with grapefruit. Uh, grapefruit in and of itself is not harmful and, in fact, possesses high quantities of vitamin C and other healthy benefits. But their impact on your cytochrome P450 can greatly affect the strength of a dose of medicine. So now you can understand why it's important to observe those warning labels. That is very interesting. Uh, It wouldn't affect me. I don't like grapefruit. (laughs) Not not a fan of it myself. My wife likes it a lot. Uh, But I'm now happy to know why those warning labels are on there, and it is something to be aware of. Okay, so back to our regularly scheduled stew. Mermaids. So Mermaid Riot, this feature contains, with permission, direct quotes. Were these mermaids rioting? Uh, Well, we'll see. You have to listen. (laughs) Direct quotes from a story called The Apothecary and the Mermaid, published in a book called The Doctor to the Dead, Grotesque Legends and Folktales of Old Charleston. It's a fascinating book, and I'm going to uh, put a link to it and uh, and show you guys. But we've gotten permission to... uh, to read it in Yay. full, but it's very long, so I'm going to paraphrase, um, but I'll let you know when I'm quoting from the book. So the legend goes, and this is fascinating to me. I love this story. So the legend goes that in the mid-1800s, a Dr. Trot used all his savings to open an apothecary shop in Charleston, South Carolina. What a nice guy. 
Dr. Trott set up his shop, put out his sign, and waited for people to come to him with their ailments. So an, an apothecary in those days mm-hmm. was a bit different than a pharmacist today. Many times they were the go-to physician in right. the community. They would create and dispense medications, but they would also give medical advice. Right. And sometimes do small surgeries like setting bones and extracting teeth, doing stitches. Uh, Dr. Trott had high hopes of establishing himself as the medico in Charleston, but the odds were against him. The town at that time had quite a number of newly freed slaves that made up a significant portion of the population. And they had their own ideas about medicine, rooted a little in voodoo and good old folk medicine Mm -hmm. that the townspeople had trusted and relied upon long before Dr. Trott showed up with his newfangled ways. Uh, Trot's don't trust store, that new stuff. <laughs> that's right. They just didn't trust him. And so Trot's store just didn't see all that much business. Now, he had invested all his savings into his new apothecary and had to find a way to make his venture work. So with an idea that could have come straight from P.T. Barnum, <laughs> Trot started filling his store with curiosities. curiosities. Oh, great. So, from the book, quote, Now it so chanced that Dr. Trott, the apothecary, for scientific reasons or merely curious interest, had collected in spirits of wine an uncanny museum of untimely deaths, queer creatures, and malignant things to Mm -hmm. which poor human flesh is heir, and had sequestered them in a small stock room at the rear of the prescription desk, Beyond the Wooden Grill. An oddity museum kind of, right? Wretched remnants of aborted things plucked away untimely into limbo by the hand of death. Human deficiencies Mm. and deformities and dried things under bell glasses. Sounds curious. That should pack them in. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Honestly, people are a little fascinated by that kind of stuff. So some, especially those new freed slaves that were the source of suspicion surrounding Trot, speculated that the collection of things in jars were because, and I quote, Chemists and apothecaries from the beginning of time have been known to be in league with the devil. Mm -hmm. Some have even been asserted that they are the worst of the nine sons of Satan. Wow. So they really didn't like this guy. Yeah. Well, and I think they didn't want, you know, if people were going to Dr. Trott, they weren't going to them. Right. And so, you know, he, he, this newcomer in town. Yeah. So. Uh, most likely, though, Dr. Trot was making a last-ditch effort to draw people into his shop to lay eyes on his curation of curiosities and then perhaps talk about their ailments and purchase an ointment or tincture right. and thus get their business. Come see my stuff and I'll help you with that arm of That's yours. right. So if you can just get people in, then yeah. I can sell. Uh, it's unknown, however, if interest in the morbid collection would have won out over stubborn adherence to the old ways because fate had something quite different in mind. Often it does. To the cities located along the coasts of America, and we know this here, too, in Texas on the Gulf Coast, a hurricane is a well-known and feared act of God. Mm -hmm. In a much different way, a slow-moving tropical storm can be just as dangerous and destructive. So now I'm quoting from the story directly. On the 3rd of July, 1867, at about half past 10 o'clock in the forenoon, a heavy black squall rolled across the city, followed by a drenching shower. This shower about noon abruptly changed to quite a different sort of rain. It plunged and roared as if the deep had been overturned and were descending on the town. The rain continued steadily without moderation or intermission day and night for for well nigh a month. Mm. The sky seemed truly to have burst. The rain streamed down in torrents. The countryside was inundated and lowlands swamped. The roads underwater and still, with ever-increasing force, the unabated rain poured down. The sodden woodlands rotted, dripped, and stank. The mire in the city streets was ankle-deep everywhere. In deeper puddles, half-knee-deep, the Mm. sandy roads were slop. All that was not geological rock or oyster shell was muck. People began to go about the streets with eyes a little wild and apprehensive breath. So they're getting a little scared. Right. By night, there was panic fear in many a humble hut. A wild sound of hysteria went up from the little churches. Still, the rain poured down. A woman in Cow Alley wrought herself into an hysteria of fear and walked the drowned streets, prophesying that the city would continue to drown until the mermaid was returned to the sea. Oh, the mermaid. And and being taken charge. Yeah, this is where we get on topic here. uh, And being taken charge by the police vowed that the city would sink beneath the sea unless she herself was immediately released from the jail. And the mermaid returned to the deep. Everyone became convinced that there was a mermaid ashore. 
The excitement went on for three weeks while undiminished rain fell without ceasing. Hard and harder it pound, pounded it down. Loud and louder grew the murmur of the kennels in the town. Louder the muttered demand that the mermaid be returned to the sea. And still the rain poured down. Then occurred one of those strange, wild outbursts of mob terror which blast the folk from Kennel and Court, Low Lane, and Darkened Alley. The people arose. A mob moved down the town, leaderless, formless, terrified, angry, and dangerous. That sounds a bad, bad time. Gathering strength as they went, their clamor through the lower part of the city and their turbulent uproar made such a disturbance that the alarm bells rang in belief that there was a rising among the black folk. At first, the mob believed that the trouble focused on the waterfront. When they moved hither, the mood of the crowd was so ugly that no white man, be he ever so notable, could have made his way safely down High Battery Street that day. The air was strangely offensive on the waterfront, but no mermaid was to be found. Mm. Some, sniffing the air, cried out that she was dead. But this could not be so, for the rain had not yet ceased falling. The mermaid, therefore, could not have died. One woman, who professed knowledge, said that the mermaid had a baby in the sea, and that until she was released to go back to nurse her child, the rain would continue to fall. Oh. Isaac Tucker, the apothecary's porter, whispered to a friend or two that among the things in Trot's shop on a top shelf stood a mermaid, Uh-oh. shrunk to scarcely a span long in all her delicate beauty, strange and marvelous, marvelously diminished in a clear glass jar of pale green water, her yellow locks floating about her like the tendrils of a pumpkin vine, and that in the jar with with her, two goldfish swam about her round and round. Hmm. This rumor swiftly became brooded about that the old apothecary had a mermaid captive in his yeah, shop. He's got, he's got her stuck in there. That's why we're <laughs> that's why we're drowning because there's all this rain because he's holding a mermaid captive. So the report went abroad on the wings of the wind that Doctor Trot, the apothecary, had a mermaid captive in his shop king street the narrow thoroughfare flanking the apothecary's shop was filled by the sound of shuffling feet and the savage ominous muffled mutter of frightened and angry voices lifting at last to a dull roar so the mob's getting Mm. more and more worked up the cross streets were choked by the mob for more than two blocks around no man on foot could come or go it was with the greatest difficulty the panic-struck mob was prevented from at once battering in the shop windows and wrecking the place. Yeah. They pelted the walls with mud and stones. They broke the windows of the upper story and beat upon the barred and bolted doors and shutters closed upon the street below. The apothecary's assistant huddled in the upper room under the roof. At first, an old and habitual timidity held them back, but non-interference made them bold. The law was remote, and the constables, watch, and city guard, daunted by the strange uprising, held aloof. The mortimerious pushed to the front, shrieking hysterically, bring out the mermaid. Bring out the mermaid. Bring out the mermaid. There is no mermaid here, said the apothecary, Trot, appearing, appearing at an upper window. On my honor, there's no mermaid here. But we know there is, yelled the, the mob. Do not listen to him. Bring her out. And they pound it with, and he, the spokesman of the mob, pound it with his fists upon the door. There is a mermaid, yelled the mob. Bring her out. Send her back to the sea. But I assure you, there is no mermaid here, repeated the apothecary. Can you imagine being yeah. Dr. Trot trying to convince these people? And I think that he kind of, you know, he kind of liked the idea that people thought there was yeah, a mermaid I'm, in his shop at once. Finally, he's time, getting some attention. But, yeah, well, but no, maybe not. Bad publicity is better than no publicity. <laughs> So, so he assures the mob that there is no mermaid, but he was a liar and known to be by the mob. And but for the <laughs> circumstances, no one would have believed a word he said. So as it was, his statement only added to the unreasoning frenzy of the mob. Several white men of the gentry class, who with some difficulty had made their way into the shop through a western window in the building, now addressed the mob from an upper window, begging them to disperse. But the mob was determined to enter the shop. The gentleman said that could not be and would never do, but they promised that the shop would be searched, and if found, the mermaid would be set free. They searched, but of course they found no mermaid. They searched again. There was no mermaid. There was no mermaid anywhere in the apothecary's shop. So the white gentleman and the three black searchers went out upon the back roof and said to the crowd, There is no mermaid here. Upon our word of honor, go to your homes and keep the peace, or the army must be called to disperse you. Just at that moment, the rain stopped. The rain stopped. Oh. The sun came out and shone brightly, so all the people went home. Now, 
I've read several different versions of this story because this is a huge legend right. in Charleston. Other versions of the story have the apothecary roof giving way under mm-hmm. all the rain and thus washing the mermaid out to uh-huh. sea, freeing her to be reunited with her baby. And either way, That's the, the rain, Disney version, I the think. rain <laughs> stopped. Yeah, the pro- <laughs> the Disney fied version. Uh, but the rain stopped just before the mob did any damage or revor- resorted to violence. It isn't known exactly what happened to Doctor Trot. He yeah. moved away shortly after this incident. All his business fell because, off. Because, yeah, you know, I would move away too. And some say he died soon after, but still others say that he moved out of the country to, to a place far inland from the threat of any mermaids. Right. Uh, gave up his pr- profession and took a job in a grocery store. That's safer. Yeah. But the apothecary, the building that it was in, uh, is still standing in Charleston today and is a historical landmark. Oh, man, that would be a great place to go see. Yeah, <laughs> I love that story. And who, where did we get that from? Oh, oh goodness. Well, I got it. I read it in several different places, right. but it was the uh, apothecary and the mermaid from the book "The Doctor to the Dead: Grotesque Legends and Folk Tales." And of thank old you to Charleston. them for giving us permission to read. Absolutely, yeah, read that. Uh, read that fascinating story. I love that. Well, there's another city with an association with mermaids, and of course, that's Norfolk, Virginia. Its connection is a modern one, as the city adopted the mermaid as its symbol in 1999 and has fully embraced the legendary creature as its own. The mermaid appears on letterhead, has inspired cocktails and various crafts. The unique branding brought the focus to the area's prime waterfront location, as well as depicting the community as fun and approachable. You can see mermaids all throughout the town. There's at least 80 statues of differing sizes and colors known as Mermaids on Parade. So check them out if you're ever in the area of Norfolk. Yeah, I want a uh, a cocktail, a mermaid cocktail. A mermaid what does cocktail. that look like, I wonder? Yeah, we had it with your tater tots. <laughs> now, one of, the, one of his most popular attractions of the great showman P.T. Barnum, I love P.T. Barnum, yeah. was the Fiji mermaid. In the 1840s, many people paid 50 cents hoping to see a long-limbed fishtail beauty. Instead, they saw a grotesque fake corpse a few feet long, constructed of a monkey torso, fishtail, and some paper mache to put it all together. To our modern eyes, it looks pretty fake, but it fooled many people back then. It, it's pretty strange looking. Have you seen it? Because I have. Yeah. We have a picture, and we're going to put that up. Absolutely. Yeah, Ugh. yeah. People did did look at it with awe and wonder. Uh, there were also these things called Jenny Hanover's souvenirs, made from the dried bodies of rays sold to vacationers. As they, uh, as they preserved m- remains of mermaids. That was from BizarreJournal.com. Jenny Hanover's were popular in the mid-16th century when sailors around Antwerp, Belgium, docks began uh, selling them to tourists. This practice was so common in the Belgium city that it uh, may have influenced the name. It is widely believed that Jenny Hanover is a corruption of the French phrase Jeune d'Anvers, our young person of Antwerp. British seamen began calling the mermaid creatures Jenny Hanover's, and the name stuck. And, and I think it's interesting that the sailors may or may not have been trying to to pass them off as, as the real thing, as, as mermaids. They were probably trying to make some drinking money would be my guess, <laughs> the thing. Yeah. The theme no, is, I like is sailors. drunken sailor. Yeah. Yeah. Again, to our modern eyes, it is easy to see that it is not a mermaid. But to people back then, they were realistic looking. It took a Swiss naturalist named Conrad Gessner in 1558 to debunk these creations. In his publication, he cautioned that these mermaids were nothing more than dead, disfigured rays. But the Jenny Hanovers remained popular, and some people still believed that they were proof of the existence of merfolk. And in some parts of the world, Jenny Hanovers are still sold to tourists as souvenirs but they are becoming an increasingly rare form of folk art due to conservation efforts. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, and we're going to have some pictures out All right. there. They're uh, kind of ugly. Another mermaid hoax was perpetrated by Joe Mulhatton, known by some as America's greatest hoaxer. This comes from a website called bizarrejournal.com. From Bizarre Journal, we learned that Joe Mulhatton was born near Pittsburgh in 1853. 
the only child of a Presbyterian minister. You know you how preachers' watch, kids that's are. That's right. You, know, you have to watch those preachers' kids. Yeah, he was all. He was by all accounts a very intelligent child. He did well in school and then became a very successful salesman. He also came to be known as one of America's greatest hoaxers. Joel was re- remarkably creative in perpetrating his many different hoaxes, included the, the time that he had the entire nation convinced that a gigantic meteor had fallen in Texas. <laughs> Are that they were bird-eating trees growing in the Mexican state of Chihuahua. That's awesome. Yeah, I like that one. Uh, one notable hoax was the Montana Mermaid. Mulhutton published a story in 1892 in the Helena, uh, Montana Independent newspaper in which he described a cave teeming with mermaids. Okay, I was wondering, because Montana, yeah. you know, well, not exactly not by quite the on, Not quite your waterfront property there in Montana, is it? Uh, we discovered a in a subterranean lake a race of human beings with scales and tails. They are amphibious and subsist on eyeless fish, bats, and mushrooms, which abound in great profusion in this wonderful cavern. Well-known and responsible citizens of Helena, where uh, who were with me, can vouch for the veracity of these statements. We succeeded in capturing one of the females. She is genuinely mermaid beyond all question. About 50 others that were playing with her on the banks of the subterranean lake plunged into its deep waters as the exploring party approached. She is a very beautiful creature with pearly teeth. Her hair is raven black and falls in great profusion and luxuriously about her four foot down, about four feet down her back. She's a fine specimen, physically stands about five feet, 10 inches and weighs 170 pounds. That's interesting. She stands yeah. at Yeah, stands five on her flippers, I guess. <laughs> he went on to state that a doctor who was in the party captured a male, and he was holding a large glass tank, or was building a large glass tank, so that he could display the merman in the rotunda of the Helena Hotel. The story even came with a significant aff- affidavit, which proclaimed, Wait. To whom it may concern, before me, a notary public in and for the county of Lewis and Clark, state of Montana, appeared Dr. C.K. Cole, Attorney General Haskell, Judge Armitage, and Jerome Norris, who hereby testify on oath that a race of amphibious human beings with scales and tails was discovered in a subterranean lake near the Broadwater Hotel, February 26, 1892. The affidavit was signed, James Saunders Sr., Notary Public, Helena, Montana. The newspaper announced that it would follow up the story, It was later reported that none of Mulhutton's witnesses could be located. After that, the hoax just quietly faded away. So it it looks really (laughs) official with, I mean, he had a notary public. For a while, yeah, it looked official. But then suddenly all the people just disappeared. So what happened there? What a fun guy. (laughs) Now for today's bookshop spot the part of the show where we take you on a virtual tour of one of the most magical of places, an independent bookshop. Today I'm excited to feature the Book Loft of German Village. This bookstore was founded by, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, Carl Jacobsma, Jacobsma and Roger Tompkins in 1977. It's so been it's around been, a while. It has yeah. been around a while. Great. It's also one of the country's largest independent bookstores. It takes up an entire city block of Columbus, Ohio. Sweet. Now, that's a big store. That's huge. In a college town. Exactly. Right. Right. So you should see the pictures on the website, and I'll get to that in a minute. The Great. book loft is 32 rooms of around 800,000 discounted new books in a pre-Civil War historic building. Wow. That goes way back. So along with books, they also offer puzzles, games, literary swag, cards, etc. And they also host live events nearly every week, usually in their store, but of course on YouTube during strange, unprecedented times. Uh, Such as these. Yes, such as these. (laughs) The events range from small local author events to hosting Ohio's biggest literary festival. And again, probably going to butcher it. It's the Ohioana. 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 I think it's Ohioana. My wife's from Ohio. Book festival. So, you know. <laughs> right. So you can find them online at the Book Loft on Facebook and Instagram, the Book Loft GV on Twitter, the Book Loft of German Village on YouTube, or of course their website, bookloft.com. And like I said, their website's got pictures on it that just 
makes me want to go visit so bad. There's a brick pathway through a garden just next to the shop that looks nice. like an enchanted world. Oh, nice. And I don't know if it belongs to the store, if it's just there, but uh, the store is so huge and full of books you could get lost A full for city days. block. That's a big that's store. That's a lot of books. Right. That's, a lo- that's a lot of a building. That's awesome. Right. And th- the owner says, if you visit the shop, you may even run into Nelson, a wandering cat who likes to shank- hang out at the oh. shop at night. you got to have a bookshop cat for sure. Okay, so from Live Science, uh, an art- from an article called Mermaids and Other Marine Monsters, it says, Modern mermaid reports are very rare, but they do occur. So this isn't just a thing in the past. Well, not, not just in the past. For example, news reports in 2009 claim that a mermaid had been sighted off the coast of Israel in the town of... Kiryat. Kiryat, okay, yeah. Kiryat, Yam. It, or she, performed a few tricks for onlookers just before sunset, and then she disappeared for the night. One of the first people to see the mermaid... Shlomo Cohen. Shlomo. I like that. Shlomo Cohen. Said, I was with friends when suddenly we saw a woman laying on the sand in a weird way. At first I thought she was just another sunbather, but when we approached, she jumped into the water and disappeared. We were all in shock because she had a tail. Wow. The town's tourism board was delighted yeah. with this newfound fame and offered a million-dollar reward for the first person to photograph the creature. Unfortunately, the reports vanished almost as quickly as they surfaced, and no one ever claimed the reward. So it's still hmm. out there if you guys yeah. think you can photograph a mermaid. And then, in and I remember this one, in 2012, an Animal Planet special, Mermaids, The Body Found, renewed interest in mermaids. It presented the story of scientists finding proof of real mermaids uh-huh. in the ocean. It was fiction. Did you guess? Right. But presented in a <laughs> fake documentary format that re- it did. It seemed very realistic. Uh-huh. The show was so convincing that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration received enough inquiries uh, following the TV special that they issued a statement officially denying the existence of it mermaids. It sounded like it must have been an April Fool's joke or something like that. <laughs> Uh, well, no, I mean, they did. They it, there Made was, it look real, for it, sure. They did. I even saw the commercial oh, for it, and I was <laughs> like, what is this? Anyway, so, okay. A temple in, okay, Fukuoka. here we go. Fukuoka. Yeah, Fukuoka, Japan, is said to house the remains of a mermaid that washed ashore in 1222. Its bones were preserved at the behest of the priest who believed the creature had come from the legendary palace of a dragon god at the bottom of the ocean. So for nearly 800 years, the bones have been displayed, Mm -hmm. and water used to soak the bones was said to prevent diseases. So only a few of the bones remain, and since they have not been scientifically tested and probably won't anytime soon, uh, their true nature remains unknown. I see. Mermaids may be ancient, but they are still with us in many forms. Their images can be found all around us in films, books, Disney movies, and the Starbucks, said, yeah. Starbucks, Starbucks, and maybe in the ocean waves if we look close enough. How about that? And now it's time, boys and girls, for the trivia challenge. <laughs> now we have a winner for the Yuletide trivia challenge, and just to remind you, the question, the trivia question on that one was: Name the Christmas dinner tradition from the Orient. That involves an American-based franchise founded by an ornery Southern gentleman with an honorable military title. Well, our winner is Diane DeBarros. Yay, Yay Diane. And uh, she, she uh, correctly answered on our Facebook page that in Japan, Kentucky Fried Chicken is a Christmas tradition. So. They, they line up outside of the restaurants <laughs> to get their Christmas dinner. Right. Finger-looking good chicken. Visit the Colonel. So thank you, Diane, for, for listening, and uh, thank you all for participating in the Trivia Challenge. Okay, so we have an answer to the Trivia Challenge question on our episode of Imposters. And it was a man who was angry with critics, I love this one, that he was angry with critics that dismissed his wife's art, decided to pose as an accomplished modern artist. Right. Oh, this is good. Who, who, who's gone to an, an art you know, uh, museum My and thought, I could do My three-year-old do better that. than that. That's right. <laughs> well, so yeah, he if you took, hang a banana on the wall, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> he took up a paintbrush for the first time in his life and created the very crudely done painting, 
exaltation, which is also known by a much funnier name because the starfish he was trying to portray ended up looking more like a banana. (laughs) That began an art movement that ended abruptly as front page news in the LA Times when the whole thing was found to be a hoax perpetrated to embarrass the art critics. What was the man's name and what was the short-lived art movement he began? Extra points if you could tell us the painting, what the painting was otherwise known as. So, did, did somebody actually find this no out? No way. Yes. Uh, yes. I, can I guess? And can I guess? Go, go can ahead. I, can yes. I s- it was Harbin. It was Harbin. It had, it had to be to Harbin. Be Harbin. <laughs> <laughs> Harbin was our winner. And with his answer, Paul Jordan Smith, husband of artist Sarah Bixby Smith, painted, Sorry. Yes, We Have No Bananas, <laughs> officially <laughs> named Exaltation, launching the disumbra. This disumbrationism art movement. Very good, Harbin. And you guys need to go look up that painting. Like, you know, it is. I've seen the picture. I could do it. I could do it. I think I just did that in my book today. (laughs) Very good. So, for today's trivia challenge, remember to like and follow our Facebook page at Remnant Stew Podcast. Like and share this episode post. Put your answer to the trivia challenge question in the comments of that post. The first person to do all that will be the winner and will be mentioned in the next episode of Remnant Stew. Yeah, you guys, you guys know how it works by now, right? Right, exactly. So what English folk song, sung by many, but most notably Peter, Paul, and Mary, features mm-hmm. a cursing mermaid? Hmm, that's a good question. Remnant Stew is created by me, Leah Lamp, Dr. Stephen Meeker, and I research, write, and host each episode. Audio is produced by Philip Sinkfeld, Yay, whose Phillip. random comments can be heard throughout the episodes. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod with voiceover by Morgan Hughes. You can connect with us through our Facebook and Instagram. And if you have an idea you'd like to hear us cover in a future episode, or you do that whole farting swimming thing let us know about it you can email suggestions to us at stay curious at remnant yeah, send us a video with that uh, <laughs> we'd like to see that <laughs> before you go please hit the subscribe button so you won't miss an episode also if you would please take time to give us a review on itunes it truly means a lot to us share remnant stew with your friends your family your marine biologists local mermaid or your remnant cryptid and until next time as always Please choose to be kind and And always always stay stay curious. curious.